Good evening, everybody. Tonight, I would like to take a few minutes from the news to read you a letter. For all it tells of the personal experience of one person, it describes a very frequent experience of many, many others. It's from the wife of a veteran who was discharged in the Army just three months ago. Dear Mr. Thomas. Four years ago, my husband went into the Army. All at once, the newspaper headlines came to life. A war from a thousand battlefronts with tongue-twisting names put its foot inside my door. For this was my husband, the father of my child, going off to fight. Be brave, keep your chin up, just wounds. All I knew was the sheer agony of parting from the dearest thing in my life. He went into the infantry a foot soldier like millions of others, marching home by way of the rest of the world. He was at Salerno, where men who were his friends died. Men with children, just as dear to them as our little girl is to him. Men who loved the Frankfurter at the ball game just as much as he. Men whose mothers and wives prayed just as fervently as I. They died. But God was with him and he lived. Yes, they died and he came through, alive and sound. He was at a casino where real flesh and blood men, not just statistics, traded their lives for a bit of ground too small to hold their bodies. And yet, though bomb and bullet and bayonet tried for the honor of killing him, once again he came through. Four years of this. Four long years of this grim Cook's tour. With every advance offering death, still another chance. All through those long 50 hour days and 100 day months, I lived in fear of hearing the doorbell ring. Reading that telegram that starts, award the property. But no, the telegram never came. The war ended and my husband was still alive. Almost before the impact of this miracle had dawned upon me, he was home, safe in my arms. The misery and the longing and the worry and the danger were all behind him. He was home. And he was safe. There is nothing in this world that I wouldn't give or do, Mr. Thomas. If this letter could end here, the simple, heartwarming story of happiness regained. But life, unfortunately, is not always like the movies and happy endings often turn out to be not endings at all, but beginnings, beginnings of sorrow and misery. Three months after my husband was discharged, life was beginning to return to normal. He had his old job back with the promise of even better things to come. The baby who had become a little girl during his absence learned to love the man who was the photo on the piano come to life. And I, well, I felt as though I had begun to live again. As I look back now, I can't remember just what I was thinking about that morning. What to have for dinner, or perhaps the invitation to the Clark's party. But it doesn't matter. For every plan and dream ended that morning at an intersection on the way to town. My husband was in his car waiting for a light to change. I'll never know whether he saw the man in the big sedan. But even if he had, there was no time to ask. Well, this man speeded up to beat the light, tried to make a sharp right turn, and crashed into it. <laughs> this man who killed my husband was trying to make a light, trying to save one minute's worth of time. Imagine all the years of devotion and happiness together that we deserved and would have had. All sacrifice. And for what? If 
During the war, he had died fighting on some foreign field. I might have found some consolation, knowing he had helped achieve something he believed in. But how can I feel? Realizing that his life was traded for just 60 seconds of time. It seems incomprehensible to me that a nation like ours, which rose as one person, to beat off the murderous attacks of fanatical madmen, can allow this double-headed enemy of carelessness and criminal selfishness to continue its reckless destruction of lives and homes. We can't sit idly by and say it was just an accident, for it's not that at all, Mr. Thomas. It's wanton murder. During the four years that America was fighting for its life, 212,000 men, an average of 53,000 a year, lost their lives. Now that the war has ended, we think that terrible waste is over. Ah, but that's an illusion. The horrible slaughter continues. This year alone, traffic accidents will kill more than 40,000 living, breathing human beings. Imagine the entire population of Joplin, Missouri, or St. Petersburg, Florida, or Joliet, Illinois, wiped off the map. Then you have some idea of what this Holocaust means. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of other healthy men, women, and children will be maimed, crippled, have their lives ruined. Because someone decided to take a chance or tried to save a man. Accident statistics may seem small compared to the millions and billions that are lightly tossed around these days. But remember, these statistics mean lives lost. People, people who lived and loved and whose passing has left a void in the hearts of their dear ones. That empty place at the dining room table, the empty seat in the classroom, the vacant desk in the office. These things are just criminal waste. For by far the largest number of our traffic accidents that take such a heavy toll of our citizens are avoidable, completely avoidable. With just a little more care, A little more consideration for the other fellow. A little more common sense on the part of pedestrians as well as motorists. And we could keep thousands of people healthy and well. Let's fight this menace with every ounce of our strength. Let's keep our loved ones at the dining room table. Let's keep those smiling faces at their schoolroom desk. Let's allow our citizens to go on living useful, healthy lives. Unless we all do our part, a million and a half people, one out of every hundred in this country, will be killed or hurt this year. Remember, accidents are not just things that happen to other people. You may be next.